record on this computer. Here we go. Okay. And last but not least, let's introduce Lori. So Lori Snyder is an indigenous herbalist and educator with a deep knowledge of the edible, medicinal, and wild plants here that grow um, all around you in common spaces of the Coast Salish territories. Uh, Lori has worked with a number of amazing projects. Um, I was just reading up <laughs> about you, Lori, <laughs> and you've certainly done a lot. Um, yeah, she's worked with elementary schools, uh, teaching there. She supported development of nine indigenous foodscapes on school grounds in Vancouver, which I think is amazing. Uh, she collaborates with community gardens. She leads plant walks and talks, and she even uh, did a Vancouver TED Talk. So we're very, very, very lucky that she's here today. Um, and yeah, we're very thankful. And Lori, I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit mo about, more about your heritage. I wanted to introduce you uh, that way, but I was afraid I'd do a terrible job at pronouncing all of the names. <laughs> so I thought I'd hand it over to you and then, yeah, just, just take it away. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Thank you for those beautiful, kind words. And uh, yeah, I've been, you know, sharing for the last seven years. I mean, something I've been walking probably my whole life, but really stepped out into the public. And, um, but before I really talk about myself as, as I believe it was Donna who just made a comment about acknowledging the territories, which is always an important part of when I come to do any teaching. And so I'm, I'm here in East Vancouver. So this is the unceded lands of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam people. And one of the things that really came to me is I started thinking about, wow, I'm really in this place of privilege because I have this audience of many people coming to to listen take the time to listen and so what i feel is my responsibility is to bring forward the voice of the ancestors of this land so part of my practice now and acknowledging is to do exactly that and um, this person um, was very well known um, back in the 70s 60s 70s maybe even the 80s and this is uh, Chief Dan George. And um, what I wanted to share is one of his quotes. And, you know, he's written books. He's, you know, shared many teachings. And he talked about, um, he said, a time will soon be here when my grandchild will long for the cry of the loon, for the flash of the salmon, the whisper of the spruce needle, and the screech of an eagle. But he will not make friends with any of these creatures. And when his heart aches with longing, he will curse me. Have I done everything to keep the water fresh? Have I done everything to keep the air clean? Have I done everything to make sure that that eagle could fly in freedom? Have I done everything to earn my grandchild's fondness? I, I so appreciate those words of Chief Dan George because I feel so much that really leads me in and guides me in this journey of, of, of sharing and teaching. And, um, and that's part why I do it because I really want to leave this a better place than what I found it. And I'll tell you, you know, growing up back in the 1960s, born up at the base of the chief up in Squamish, it was an amazing place, you know, playing with grasshoppers, finding tree frogs, garter snakes. Um, you know, my parents' backyard had wild animals coming in into our into our yard. And really that's what I really would love for the younger generation to be able to witness as I witness that. And and here's what we've discovered is each generation is witnessing less and the following generation doesn't even know that it's missing. So, um, yeah, thank you to Chief Dan George to keep us on track on what, what we're here to do. And as Charlotte said, just a little bit about my, my, my background is growing up in Squamish, um, my next door neighbor was actually my teacher, my first teacher. She was from Ireland. And, you know, coming over from another country and recognizing that the plants here are different than the ones in her homeland. She took it upon herself to teach us kids in the neighborhood 
as we would walk up these back trails to Alice Lake, she would start that introduction. You know, the cedar tree, the Douglas fir, the bleeding heart, the uh, fireweed, the salmonberry, the miner's lettuce. So all these incredible older brothers and sisters that so many of us don't even know who they are. So that's part what I want, want to do today here. And the other is, you know, I, I feel that it's so important in this time that we know the stories of this land, the people of this land, their stories, but also reflecting back on our own stories. Where are we from? Who are our ancestors? And what were those teachings that they passed on to us that we might have actually forgotten? So I have a, a, a blend of many nations from around Turtle Island. Um, it was my grandmothers who were marrying the Scottish fur traders and um, uh, the Donald and Grant clan and also um, fur traders from Normandy, France. And on my dad's side is uh, um, Welsh and English. And my sister just had her DNA done. It turns out we've got Swedish in our background too. So, oh. I guess it was my daughter that's connected to my speaker. So her music was just coming in. So my apologies. Um, and you know, as, as um, Charlotte mentioned, I go into a lot of schools to teach and that's part what I want to bring to their, their consciousness, their awareness of, you know, what are, wh where are they from? Do they have their cultural language? Do they eat their cultural food? And for us to celebrate this diversity in our cultures. This is very important in this time that we recognize if we're gonna be strong and continue to move into the, the future, we need biodiversity. We need all the species here with us for us to be strong. So, and that's also in the human family. Let's, let's celebrate um, um, our stories and our teachings. So with that being said, um, my computer, I dropped water on it a couple weeks ago and everything's slower. So I'm working off my phone. And yesterday I went up to this beautiful medicine wheel that I caretake up at Moberly Arts and Cultural Center and took some photos. So um, I will be sharing my screen here and we'll, we'll, we'll find, okay. Um, so Charlotte, can you somehow make me your co-host so I, I can actually go into the screen? Yes. Let okay. me, I'm just going to exit full screen. Um, no, all good. So I, you know, I, uh, I'll just mention a couple of the plants and if you guys have any questions as well, you know, I want to talk about the bleeding heart, the salal, the Oregon grape, yarrow, strawberries you know sometimes we don't even think about that strawberries we have three types of um, native strawberries that grow here on the coast we have i believe 23 different varieties of berries in our um, within our bio region and you know my question would be how many of us are eating the foods of this land and then the next piece would be how does that actually shape us how does that impact us when we're eating the foods from here? Does it um, help us to feel more connected and really call this land our home? And would it actually shift us that we would be, you know, standing up more with our indigenous brothers and sisters to protect, you know, the waters and protect that, you know, to make sure a black snake isn't coming across our province? and that we don't allow more tankers into our water. So, and another thing that I, I would share is, you know, for us to remember that food is our medicine. And um, boy, when we're eating seasonally, what a gift, what an incredible gift that is. So I think, here we go, my friend. Sorry, so you get to see my finger as I come and press the screen. And um, I need my glasses here so I can see which one so let's start with this one just because it's the first one there we go um, I'm sure most of you know this is uh, salmonberry I'm sure there's lots down at Maplewood Flats 
you can see there's her um, she's in flower so this was just taken yesterday you can see just below that um, the flower has been pollinated and we're going to start to see some fruit growing here salmon berry comes in yellow orange red and uh, dark berries as well beautiful food for us to access and we can get a medicine from the leaf that we can make some beautiful teas which is um, very supportive of our muscles in particular to the uterine muscle so this would be a great plant we could drink while we're pregnant make sure that that muscle stays strong to carry that baby and one of the other things that I would mention, and sorry, I have to do this one photo at a time because it doesn't let me just go through all of my, my photos, um, is that um, what I want to share with you is last year, you know, my, my partner and I, we've been harvesting this beautiful plant for quite a few years. We, I go out and we pick some berries, we make some beautiful jams. I share that with the children to have them taste wild berry jams for them to start that journey and last year i went out and started the collection and realized wow i'm not seeing a lot of berries and here's the thing that i want to help everyone remember the more that we're out in nature we start to witness the changes that are happening and they can be subtle you know really subtle changes or they can be you know uh, a, a lot more dramatic and drastic in short periods of time and so we didn't harvest any berries last year just because we recognized we really wanted to make sure that we were leaving berries for the birds and again those are you know the places where we really need to think about um, what our responsibilities are as the two-legged species how do we uh, practice reciprocity and that might be in our honorable harvest where we're asking permission, um, bringing a, some of our sacred plant herbs to, to leave as offerings, whether tobacco, cedar here from the coast, sage, sweetgrass, even rice in some cultures is considered a sacred um, medicine. We can also leave a little bit of our hair and, oh, I think this one's the same image, but I'm going to put it back up again. Uh, we can also leave a little bit of our hair. That's another way. That's how my teacher, Don Olson, taught me. Or even to think about that, you know, the, the cycles and recognizing that we're part of the ecosystem and that even leaving our, our, our urine can be a great nitrogen uh, load for some of these plants. The reason I wanted to come back to this image is I wanted to point out the leaf structure here. So it appears like there are three leaves there on the stem, but that's actually one leaf. Those are called leaflets. And if I turn that leaf upside down, it would look a little bit like a beard or a goatee with two mustache. Or if I flip the goatee down, you're going to notice the outline of a butterfly. So that's one of the ways that we can uh, identify to make sure that we're um, harvesting the right plant. And I would say, please make sure that you get a really good guidebook. And that would be the one by Pojar and McKinnon. And uh, I think that's, no, sorry, I didn't want to show that one, but I, I will anyways, because it's there. Uh, so what is that? Coastal Plants of British Columbia by Pojar and McKinnon. Or get a really good uh, app for your phone. So in this garden bed, at the front of the picture, you can notice this is uh, chives or green onions. It's actually chives. But in the back of this photo was uh, nodding onion. So let me bring up another photo of the nodding onion. See if we get a, a better look here and okay this one's nodding onion beautiful plant love her she's amazing so you can see in the background there there's the the chives or the nodding uh, uh, the green onions 
how we identify nodding onion is it has a flat leaf. And like the chives or green onions, you can harvest this leaf and, you know, chop it up, add it into your salads. It's quite spicy and um, it's got a beautiful flavor to it. We can, um, and, and noticing the difference, this one's a flat leaf as the other one has a hollow leaf. And this is going to produce a beautiful flower, which I don't have a picture of at the moment as it hasn't quite come up into bloom. This is an amazing pollinator plant. It has a sort of a pink purple flower that seems to be nodding. So it looks like it's falling, looking down at the ground. And um, what all, why, another reason why I really love this plant is I want to help people to remember to collect the seeds. So once the flowers um, been pollinated, it's, it's going to drop or you're going to be able to collect these beautiful tiny little black seeds that you can gift back out to your neighbors and your friends and your family. But the other thing is we could actually take them up into our mountains and help to populate our native plants more up in, in those areas. So a, a good practice of seed sharing, but also recognizing we can put this food back up in the woods so that our... Oh, I'm just trying to get that to come back up so that we can put it back up in the woods. And then that becomes a food for our deer, our elk, and, you know, even the bears. The bears like to dig up the roots, and you can too, and take out the larger roots to, um, to roast, uh, to cook up. I wouldn't eat them so much raw. I think I would do them more roasted. And they're unbelievably delicious. You know, the longer you roast them, the sweeter they are. So that's the nodding onion. This image is our um, Pacific Bleeding Heart. And this is under the Nootka Rose up at the Medicine Wheel Garden that I caretake up at Moberly Arts and Cultural Center. That's up at Prince Albert in East 62nd. So if you happen to be out in South Vancouver, Please stop by and have a look at this amazing garden. She likes a dappled forest. You know, she doesn't want to be out in the in the sunlight. And I have one more image here that I can share. That um, what I want you to know is that the leaf of the nodding onion is edible. So you can add that into your, you know, into your salads. I'm sitting outside watching a bumblebee. Oh, bumblebee pollinate your uh, your bleeding heart. I love it. That's so beautiful. And what a gift of all those native bees, making sure that we're putting in our native plants so that uh, the native bees have access to the to their food source. This is um, oh, I wrote something down here. This is a nectar plant. Uh, as well as um, an important food source for our ants when the flower goes into the seed and you're going to notice at the end of the flower that there's sort of um, it's like a little pocket or a little sword it almost looks like a little sword sticking out like a tongue is sticking out and that's where the seeds are and you can collect those seeds and again we could add them back up into our forest on the edges of meadows when we go off hiking food source for the ants on the little seed there's a little white dot i believe it's essential fatty acids that's on that dot and so the the ants are actually moving the seeds and there's that reminder that like all species we all help each other out so birds are moving um, you know, bears are moving seeds, squirrels are moving seeds, we need to be moving seeds too. The other thing we can do with the bleeding heart is we can harvest the root and we can put it into an alcohol tincture. This tincture is very good to tonify the body, so maybe after an illness or we're convalescing, we really want to help to support the whole body system. And the one other thing that we can actually do with the bleeding heart is we can uh, make a beautiful um, flower essence tincture with a uh, flower essence for with the flower, which we then use for our emotional state. 
and this is going to help to repair any grief or a broken heart so what a beautiful plant not only for us but you know for others that are growing here with us so who do we have next Lori? Yes, my friend. I have a question. Yes. I know common names can be arbitrarily picked, but oh. would, that, would that bleeding heart name have anything to do with that property that you just suggested? Um, yeah, names can be tricky because, you know, um, I, I've started um, doing some work with the David Suzuki Foundation as a butterfly ranger. And um, Latin names are always important if you really want to make sure that you identify um, as why they called it bleeding heart. Maybe it's just the shape of that flower. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Dentra uh, Dicentra di Sibilius. Sorry, I'm terrible with my Latin names. I've been working on that. Um, as there are other bleeding hearts we can find um, around the world. We also have a, a bleeding heart from uh, the East Coast. So again, we really want to, you know, make sure we're identifying the, the right plant, finding out our Latin names, and then um, hopefully putting them in our gardens for our native bees and, and uh, pollinators on this side of the planet. So I don't know how well you guys can see that. This is evergreen huckleberry. And I'm going to show you another photo here of that one that might be a little bit closer. And this one would be, you know, could do quite well in a container garden. So anybody who's got a balcony and doesn't necessarily have a garden space. And you can see she's already started to produce her little flowers they're like little upside down bells similar to a blueberry and these berries are very tiny like they're probably half the size of my fingernail so they're quite small and the harvest time is going to be later in the season anywhere from september i've seen them all the way up into january i've done some harvesting with the evergreen huckleberry Colors of berries are very important. They tell us something about them as a food. They're high in our antioxidants, so really important. And um, I've seen, I, I found a little bit of this in some of the landscapes around Vancouver. You know, personally, I'd love to see this in everyone's gardens or down back alleys on the edges of parks, um, you know, community centers, school grounds so that we all have more access to our native berries and our foods, but also because I really wanna make sure that we're leaving the wild berries up on the mountains for other species and that we're not interrupting their, their food source. And we have more than enough room to be growing them here with us. And then what we wanna do is we wanna teach the kids when they're ready and to do the harvest and you know there's nothing more exciting and joyful when we're watching the children in there harvesting the foods and and you know able to taste them directly off those plants and and start to build that relationship so in you know in some of the teachings that i take into the school is for us to be thinking about relationship reciprocity uh, respect for our mother that we have this responsibility and um, one other R that I've sort of added into these four R's is to really have reverence like wow so grateful to be alive so grateful for where I live how strong and healthy this environment is and that you know I really want to continue to make it strong the, the image that you're seeing here is yarrow and the yarrow is uh, one of our native plants that we also find in um, many other parts of the world. And I'm always happy when I find a plant that others have a relationship to it as well. So I start to see how we truly are just one family. 
as the plants have, you know, gifted themselves in so many other places on the planet. This one, if you look at the leaf, it looks like a feather or maybe some people might say uh, like a, a little fern. And I'm going to show you another image here that you can start to see the, the flower structure happening here. This one. And so Yarrow has been on the planet for somewhere around 62,000 years. There was uh, evidence of it found on a Neanderthal man dating back that, uh, that far in northern Iraq. And um, Yarrow is very good at stopping the blood flow. So, you know, sometimes young kids go through these stages where they get chronic nosebleeds and you could take the flower or the leaf, it could be fresh or dried, you would roll it up in your hands to break open the cell walls to release the essential oils, and then you would just stuff it up the nostril, which, you know, looks a little ridiculous and might even feel funny, but here's the thing, it stops the blood immediately, and that's what we want to do, we really want to stop the blood from flowing. So what a beautiful plant that we're finding a lot in grassy areas and lots of people's lawns. Really, if we're going to grow grass or do lawns, we want a diversity of, of wild plants in that lawn. We want to have clover, plantain, yarrow, chickweed, dandelion. So we've got that diversity for all of our, our pollinators. Lori, yeah. I have a question. Uh, oh, yep. I think yep. it's from the last plant uh, from the evergreen huckleberry. Leanne is asking what zone. Um, do you know this offhand? I can, I think it is zone six. I just Googled it. I don't know. That's a good question. I, you know, I, I know that it's um, here on the coast, so I'm not sure what this zone range is here on the coast to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I guess somewhere in the middle. That, yeah. that helps. But yeah, please do Google that. And so we can answer that question. Mm -hmm. I am um, just so everyone knows I'll put together. Oh, here we are. So someone said I see a seven to nine. So I think we're eight. <laughs> right. So isn't that interesting? Everybody has a, a different uh, take on on the zones. And if you're here, uh, Leanne, here in Vancouver, then you'll have no problem at all growing. Um, uh, have no problem growing it here in this region. What else I wanted to share about the yarrow is um, this is a, a food source, so you can add this beautiful little leaf into your salads. I've been really encouraging people to eat the um, wild greens. We get a lot more nutritional value and to also, you know, what a gift when we're able to go out in our garden and then five minutes later, five minutes later, excuse me, we're actually eating these beautiful fresh plants. What you discover with yarrow, it has a bit of a bitter flavor to it. And as we age, we actually need a little bit more support and we want bitters in our diet to help um, get the gallbladder producing bile get the bile going into the stomach to actually help to break down fats. And, um, oh, you've seen yarrow in Quebec and PEI. Yeah, so we're gonna find it all around North America. You're gonna find it in Europe. You're gonna find it in the Middle East. Um, you know, you're gonna find it up North. You know, we're gonna, we find it in a lot of places. So this is a beautiful plant that, as I said, has given so much um, guidance and teachings for us foods and medicines so please make sure you're putting a little bit of bitter in with your salads the other way that i use it i will take that leaf dry it out for a couple days chop it up and then put it in apple cider vinegar and when i'm making a tincture i'm putting one part plant to two parts apple cider vinegar i don't want the vinegar to be sitting in the lid of whatever jar, like a plastic lid or a metal lid. I want to leave the plant in for at least four weeks and then I can strain that out. And what's going to happen is you're now going to be accessing the minerals. 
and minerals are really important for our endocrine system. So grow the yarrow. And oh, what else would I share? Yarrow is an important pollinator plant in our garden as it has, um, it supplies food to the carnivore insects that are eating the herbivore insects that are eating your plants, right? So this plant, along with sweet, sweet alyssum, which is not native, but are two important plants in our garden that we want to bring in so that we're making sure that those insects are being fed. The other thing about insects that I want to share before I talk about the salal that we have on this screen is that um, yesterday I watched that beautiful documentary called Fantastical Fungi. And uh, this was my second time to watch, and I'll probably watch a few more times. It's just got a lot of beautiful, amazing information. And what Paul was talking about is that when the mushrooms release their spores, they attract insects. And it made me go, oh my goodness, we need to have more places growing mushrooms. So in your garden, line your walkways with bark mulch. You can inoculate it with mushrooms. The mycelium will be in there, which will support your native plants like the salal. But the, those spores are going to attract the insects which then will attract the birds. So I love this information that came to me yesterday going, oh, of course, there's a whole cycle that's happening and everything connects to the next piece. So if you want to grow salal in the garden, what you need to do is make sure it has access to the mycelium for it to grow well. So I would not grow salal in a container, maybe if I put a bunch of bark mulch in there and maybe I would have some success. But this plant in particular needs to have that web for it to grow strong. And um, let me show you another image of the salal and tell you a little bit more about it. You can see here that um, the flowers have uh, formed and we're going to get a beautiful dark purple berry um, for us to be snacking on, making jams, sauces, cordials. You know, you could even infuse it into some vodka and make some kind of, you know, lovely um, uh, liqueur. Maybe add a little honey in there. I did that with my cherry blossom flowers earlier in the spring. And this plant has been studied over at the University of Victoria for five years. There was an article that came out, I think it was last year in the Globe and Mail, that talked about this being a superfood. That color, as I mentioned earlier, is very important as an antioxidant. And what he expressed, and I'm sorry, I, I, I can't remember the professor's name, he expressed this is actually more important um, for us than even blueberries. Like it, it really is a high antioxidant food. And you know, we, you know, this grows locally here. Why are we not putting it in our gardens, right? But not only is it a great food for us, it's a great host and, and pollinator nectar plant for our bees and our butterflies. So we really wanna make sure this plant is here. This is Salal. Salal, S-A-L-A-L. -A -L. And um, what I would also share is, I just mentioned it's a host plant. So the, what, what we're doing in our education with the, with the butterfly rangers is to help people recognizing that in the fall, we don't clean up the garden. What we really need to do is we need to gather the leaves and put it in the garden. We need to leave the old stems of flowers standing, or if you, if you must, you know, push them down into the garden. I like to leave them up standing. There could be seeds, seed heads there, so which would be food for the birds. That might be a place where the insects have laid eggs. When we're cleaning up our garden and taking that away, 
we're um, we're actually taking away the the the, the um, eggs. Yeah, I do recall last year, and it was that was really quite interesting. And I suspect because we had a very dry spring, and possibly the um, the roots are not very deep. They were drying out quickly. I'm just trying to get my partner. Can you just close that window? Because I can hear the kids outside. Sorry, excuse me. It's just I have to keep my focus here. Um, I believe that the root system must be shallow and, and because of the dry summer that was having an impact on them. This year they seem to be doing much better. Uh, I was up in one of the woods the other day and they're looking really, really good. So, you know, everything has a cycle. And I'm really grateful that we've been having as much rain as we've been having because um, we need to make sure the rain is coming throughout uh, the, the course of the year versus it just being in certain times, uh, you know, like in the spring and the fall and the winter. But we need to make sure we're getting that rain through the summer. So I think we've been having a good rainfall so far. We... We can make a spit poultice with the, with the leaf. We can put it on our burns in our sores. And when I refer to a spit poultice, what I'm talking about is we take that leaf and we chew it up and we're opening up the cell walls and the um, healing properties would then help with a, with a burn. Raw honey is also very effective on, on burns. And um, this was also used as a, as a trade fo uh, food. And, uh, you know, berries collected, dried, made into berry cakes. And then in the wintertime, when the potlatches ceremony and feasting would be happening, people would be doing different trades with different items. And, um, and this would have been eaten with some kind of grease. So recognizing oil, uh, ooligan fish, that's a, a greasy fish that's really important for our brain. So making sure we're eating some really good um, fish oils or eating fish and fats. Okay, so that's the Salal. Here is um, Saskatoon. Love Saskatoon. Such a, an incredible, beautiful berry. Again, we can find it all around North America, another plant that really um, connects us. Not so common here on the coast, what I understand. It likes more of a drier, um, hotter uh, uh, geography or region but you know we can grow it and if you have a dry site then oh it makes the best pies ever yes it, it's such a beautiful berry and again really fantastic color there is some medicinal properties on the in the bark I believe if I remember correctly that um, it might have been used like um as like a contraceptive, right? Like uh, an, a, an abortive. And um, here's the leaf again. I'm harvesting the berries at the bottom. Oh, how big, Hannah, good question. Oh, I have two little bushes on the shady side of my house. So um, they can get up to, I would say a good 10, 10 to 15 feet. So how many meters, two to three meters. And I'm gonna pick the berries uh, that I can reach um, full grown trees. Okay, yeah, they're a big bush for sure. And um, I can pull some of those branches down using like a, a hook on an umbrella and harvest some there. But I also want to make sure I'm leaving the really high up berries for those birds that, you know, that they're also getting their food source. The, all these images were taken from this beautiful garden that was seven years ago was just grass and i'll tell you if you go up there you will just have such a delight tons of birds hanging out in in the garden i'm just trying to find the next image here and um there's a resident hummingbird and the other thing that i noticed is the hawks come because they're looking for their dinner as well so again, that responsibility when we put in our native plants that everybody's growing um, in growing strong and choke cherries. Yeah, I don't have any choke cherries growing here, 
but yes, we could be growing some choke cherries. And you know, the other thing that's amazing about some of these berries, uh, I remember witnessing, I, what was it? What bird was it? Was it a flicker? Nope. It might've been a flicker. Anyways, it was on uh, a frozen crab apple tree uh, in January one year. Um, and I could see it had been, you know, pecking at the, um, at the crab apple. So I'm like, oh, I was so grateful that uh, someone had planted that tree and that we need to plant more of the, our native plants. So this is, um, some people had referred to it as Indian plum or Osho berry, also known as wild plum. You can see the clusters have already forming and um, they're gonna be purple in color. They're, they don't get very big, maybe the size of my thumbnail, a little bit bigger. And um, sorry, my daughter's just come in. And the, um, they're, they, they don't have a lot of flesh to them. It's mostly a pit. I tend to let them dry on the tree and then I can go back and um, harvest some of the dried um, uh, plums. And let me see if I've got another image here of that, of the wild plum. So I think that's another one here. So yeah, and right now I have so many wild plum growing under uh, the female and um, I will gladly dig them up if anybody would like some wild plum. Here's the thing, uh, is there an ID feature? Well, they kind of look a bit like uh, a plum leaf or a, um, an, an apple, like a pear leaf. I don't have an image super, super clear. I'm, you know, if you can see they're, they're kind of elongated. And if you want to have the fruit producing, you have to have a male and female plant. And the only way you can actually tell the difference is by the smell of the flower. The male flower doesn't smell so great. So very long and oblong uh, and out earlier than anything else in the spring. Yes, Madeline, the, the flower shows up before the leaf. So, you know, going, driving up to SFU, I can easily identify the wild plum going up there because I could see all the flowers coming out before the leaf came out. But you, you really need uh, a female and a male to get that fruit production happening. So let's see who else I have here in the garden of our native plants. that I took a picture of. Oh, here we go. This is our beautiful Nutka Rose. So I just noticed she came out in bloom the other day and uh, lots of bees coming, bumblebees hanging out. The leaf has antimicrobial properties. You can add leaf into your salads. You can use it as a Band-Aid. You could make a tea with it to wash your face. So if you've got acne growing, that's bacteria growing on the face. So that'll really help with uh, calming that, that overgrowth of bacteria. The petals can be harvested and put in some beautiful honey and flavor your honey as long as the, the flower petal is fragrant. As you can see in this image, you can see all the, the stipples and the pistons, sorry if, I've, if uh, I haven't said that right with my uh, botany. You can see there's a lot of pollen on this flower. I don't want to interrupt the pollination for this to turn into a rose hip by taking away those petals. Uh, a good friend of mine, Lori Weidenhammer, who's, you know, teaches a lot about uh, bees wrote a beautiful book called Victory Garden for Bees. She was um, had explained to me that the shape of the flower is an attractant for the bees. So if I start to pull away a couple of the petals, it's gonna change that, that shape for that landing pad and they're not gonna find that flower. How I could do a harvest is take the petals that have already 
fallen. You'll notice they haven't shriveled, so maybe I'm collecting them first thing in the morning, and then I can put them in the honey. Or if I have a Ragosa rose species that has a lot of petals, then I could actually take some of those petals. And what else can I tell you about the rose? Oh, the hip. Can you eat the rose hip? Yes, we can eat the rose hip. We can eat it fresh. You, um, it's okay that the seeds get eaten. They have essential fatty acids in there. The seeds are also known to kill parasites. The hip is full of vitamin C. It has zinc. Um, it has um, other, uh, oh, it's got various minerals in there. So beautiful food source. Your only thing is you need to be mindful about eating the hairs. So the hairs could go in really easy, don't notice them. But when they come through the digestive tract, yeah, don't eat the fibers around the seeds. Exactly, Leanne. Um, those hairs will make your bum itchy. So they're also known as itchy bum. Um, how, how I'm preparing, yeah, itchy bum berries, that's right. <laughs> you dry them whole for two. Tea. That's right, Leanne. That's what I do is I dry them whole for tea. I crush them with my mortar and pestle. I'll take a handful, um, add them into maybe four cups of water and bring them to a simmer. You're going to notice that the water has changed a light, beautiful pink, rosy red. Then I'm going to strain it. That way I'm not drinking the, the hairs. And what I'm also going to do is make that tea with that plant material at least three times. I really want to make sure I'm extracting everything. Oh, you you don't even you just steep them whole. Okay, I usually crush them. When I, when I'm crushing, I'm just helping to open up the cell walls for the water to easily um, um, access all the the goodness. And you can, of course, put the leave in the tea while drinking. Yes, you can do it that way too. So always, there's so many beautiful ways of us all sharing how we've been using our, our native plants. What I wanted to share was that I would simmer that uh, rose hip three times. It would end up going out in my compost. And then the compost went out into various parts of my garden. And a couple years ago, about five years ago, I thought someone had gorilla gardened um did everybody lose the audio is or is it just moira we, so, we got you here okay you still got me so it might just be more so moira, moira you might have to go back in okay good so um i thought someone else had was gorilla gardening but it turned out it was me so these seeds are super strong going through you know um, being simmered being out uh, over winter being stratified and then thrown in the ground and they still will produce an incredible plant so strength rose is about strength rose is reminding us to fall in love again right uh, you know part of the human condition is we go through heartbreaks and um you know it it really is about us living our lives in our in our love so Rose helps to repair that broken heart. And, um, and also she just brings so much beauty to all of us. So who else do I have here? How are we doing for time, my friend? We're good. Uh, so it's 6.55. Um, we've told everyone it's going to be about an hour and a half. So you have about, yeah half an hour, 15, 20, whatever you think. Okay, good. All right, so here's Oregon grape. We've got three varieties of Oregon grape. You can see um, it's already in the, the berry production here. Um, earlier in the spring, it had a beautiful little yellow flower, which you could pick and add into your salads. It's got a little bit of a sourness to it. Just remember if we're picking the flowers, then we're not going to get the berries and then we do, don't also have that early nectar for our, our yeah for our for our pollinators and yeah she's got a beautiful scent to her 
This berry, like the Salal, has a beautiful dark purple. Oh, oh, you still have the flowers. Yes. And of course, you know, Trish, we're going to see that in all different ecosystems. So um, I, I see ecosystems, you know, from East Vancouver all the way to West Vancouver. So right now, for instance, I'm seeing the Hawthorne flower here on the east side in flower production. I know I've got about two weeks before I'm going to find it over on the west side. So yeah, ecosystems um, all over, even, you know, within our own yard, we, we notice those ecosystems. It's a sour tasting berry. Sours are an indication of vitamin C, like the rose hip, we need the vitamin C. It's a great stimulus. So, you know, who knows, maybe in five years we won't have coffee. So what are we going to use to give us energy in the afternoon? Well, we can have those rose hips or eat um, anything with vi high vitamin C. Vitamin C um, helps to support the immune system when we get sick and um, repair the collagen in our body. So, you know, lots of benefits from having the, those sour foods. If you cook this up, you could make a sauce with it, uh, syrups, beautiful jams. It's like Concord grape jelly, which is, that's my experience when I've made it into um, a jam. And it also makes a beautiful hedgerow. So instead of, you know, building a fence, what we could be doing is building hedgerows, having a diversity of plants there. And... Um, uh, and then having beautiful foods. How, okay, uh, how old must the plant be before it flowers? That's a good question. Um, these plants I just recently put into the garden, and I would say they're probably five years old or so. So, you know, as long as they've got good soil, uh, the right growing conditions and you know just remember plants are like us they have their needs so we you know we really need to make sure that we're putting them in the right place so right plant for the right place and also when you're going out on your hikes up in the woods observe what you notice um, you know is it in the dappled light is it in the full light is it on the edge is it close to the water you know, all of that observation really can help us. And like any plant that's producing a, a, a food <laughs> um, or a berry, it, it's going to want some sunlight for sure. So I wouldn't necessarily put it in a full shade, but making sure that it's got some sunlight um, to get that production. You can notice sometimes the leaves will be red in color and they're quite pokey. People often mistake holly thinking holly is Oregon grape or vice versa and um, you know it also has a little bit of a um, a message if we were using that in our in our fencing or hedgerow to say you know ask permission before you come in so with that just saying the word permission uh, what I'd like to share is the honorable harvest that you know when we're doing harvesting that we really need to be respectful and do it in a good way and um, having good practices so one would be asking permission coming with uh, an offering of any of our sacred plants uh, a prayer a song a piece of hair um, we always want to leave the grandmother we only want to take 10%. If we've noticed someone else has been harvesting, then we, we you know, we're going to find another harvesting patch. Part of what I've really been advocating is putting this in our garden. So you've got it in your garden, right? That, as I mentioned earlier, that we're leaving these wild um, plants up in the wilds, up in our mountains, so that everyone, uh, that uh, all those other species, could you do this one in a container? I think you can do this one in a container. Okay, uh, Bruce and I suggested doing it in a hedgerow. Yeah, what if you're gonna do 
are there various varieties of Salau? No, Salau is only one variety. This one has three varieties. And if you were going to do a hedgerow, you might want the Mahonia aquifolium, which is the tall of the Oregon grapes. Um, this one is going to be a shorter variety. I don't think this one's going to be as tall as the Mahonia. I could be wrong, though. I forgot to look at the tag to see exactly which species this um, Oregon grape that I've just put in in the garden. So yeah, let's uh, do an honorable harvest. Let's ask permission. Let's do an offering and let's not take more than we need. I will tell you that when I would go into the salmonberry patch, she would poke at me to tell me that I need to um, trim her. And by me in that service to her, so that practice of reciprocity, she would then show me more of her berries. I will tell you, you know, when you're foraging or, or harvesting, you kind of get lost in that. It becomes a meditation. Um, your mind wanders, things float out. You know, it's, it's such a, a beautiful cleanse when we're out in the woods for our minds and our spirit and our body. And um, so I, I have a rule that if I drop three berries, I'm out of the berry patch that day. Or maybe the crow comes and starts cawing at me and um, I'll ask the question, is it time to go? So, you know, these are, these are good ways to make sure that we don't take more than we need, recognizing that we need guidance as we walk this human experience. And that, you know, in that beautiful book, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmer, she reminds us that the plants and animals are our older brothers and sisters. So they're the ones that taught us how to be here and, um, and how to walk in a good way. So here's one of my strawberry flowers. And I was happy to find her yesterday. And she's a fairly large a flower so I might actually get a, a beautiful big berry from this one and I've been adding more strawberries in along in the garden um, this is you know our first berry to show up usually the same time as Saskatoon berries that show up in June and um, also the salmon berry starts to show up in June and I think there here's some more of the of the strawberries Important food source for who is it? Robins, wax wings, and towies. So, if you want to attract those beautiful birds in your garden, uh, we need to be growing more strawberries. And the other is, you know, uh, remembering that robin, being one of our, our native birds, used to fly in flocks of thousands. When I was a kid, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, I was probably seeing about 30 robins on my parents' lawn. And, um, you know, today I'm lucky if I see one. So again, it's just another reason why we really want to have these beautiful native plants here so we can feed um, all the species. It's, uh, uh, you know, an important pollinator plant we can uh, make a beautiful tea with the leaf. It's got vitamin C and iron. So we want to, you know, find those plants that um, have that iron that's bioavailable for us. Many of us women suffer from anemia. So how are we getting our iron uh, into our body and which iron is actually bioavailable? It can help to regulate our menstrual cycles. Um, like the yarrow, the yarrow leaf, as we met, er, met earlier, the one that looks like a feather or a small fern, that one's going to help with cramping. So we've got these two beautiful plants that are giving support to us women. We can take this beautiful berry and maybe we want to mix it with a little bit of lemon and yogurt or some honey. This is going to work as a beautiful face mask for our skin. So we don't need to buy so many of these cosmetics we can actually um, you know harvest from within our garden it's going to help with inflamed skin or acne skin 
let me see if I have another image here of the of the strawberry because what a beautiful little plant she is oh yeah here we go oh just love her this is another variety as I mentioned there are three different varieties of um, strawberry there's a coastal a beach and a woodland and I believe this is the the woodland one and these are the ones that have the really tiny uh, berries which are just packed with so much flavor the other thing I want to share about the strawberries is this plant can help with seasonal allergies unless of course you have if you're allergic to strawberries and there's research out there on the on the web that you can you know find out for yourself the um, we can also take the berries and mix it with a little baking soda strawberries are full of malic acid which can help whiten our teeth so we can get off you know any of these packaged products or um, you know some some of these things that have other chemicals right we have got to recognize we're living in a very polluted world so the more we get back into um, using things from nature uh, knowing who's gonna help to strengthen our body you know give us our minerals what you know work as our supplements what are our foods how do we use them as medicine um, the better off um, you can assist the runners into new pots. Yes. So um, when the when the strawberries are putting energy into running, they're not putting their energy into uh, berry production. So once that runner has started another plant and as it's established its root system, cut the runner. So then the energy goes back into a, um, a production of fruit. And of course, that fruit is just one bit, you know, just a bundle of seeds. So you can take those seeds and you can also start. And what a beautiful, fun thing that we might do with our children is, you know, think about seed collecting. And for me, I'll tell you, when I have my seeds and I'm collecting seeds, I feel really wealthy. I feel really rich. I feel um, abundant, you know, that and knowing that I can be sharing that outwards with others right how can we start these practices of being in service to each other so i'm just um i've got my little notebook here it has calcium copper fiber omega-3s potassium iodine vitamin a vitamin c vitamin b2 b6 b b5 and vitamin k like wow this is such an amazing amazing fruit that we could be um, eating so um, I think what I'd like to do is leave you with one last teaching here because um, this to me is one of the most common plants that we are going to find everywhere that we go and um, into the trailheads when we're going off uh, hiking we're going to find her in our grasses she's going to creep into our gardens and i'm just trying to find the image here that i quite like and um it's so funny why am i not not seeing her most people would call her a weed uh, i recognize her as a food i think i'm going to do this image here because i think it's got a little bit of everything Oh, the guidebook that I mentioned is uh, Pojar and McKinnon. It's, oh, thank you. Somebody put up Plants of the Pacific Northwest. A lot of what I've been sharing and, you know, recognizing we can be cooking, we can be making medicines. We want to know when to harvest. Uh, what are some of the stories? The book that I would highly recommend is by Beverly Gray, which is called The Boreal Herbal. So if you want to get into, you know, uh, making those medicines, learning how to cook, learning the nutritional value, the boreal herbal, which showcase probably 90% of the plants we'll find here, we also find up in the boreal region. So this is the plant I want to leave you with is uh, dandelion. Um, please know that every part of this plant is edible. 
she showed up around the 15 1600s part of my history is with the Poton um, uh, nation on the east coast in what we call Virginia and you know when this plant showed up with the you know the fur traders and the settlers it uh, along with uh, plantain or white man's footprint also known as frog's leaf uh, these two plants we just started to eat recognized as a food and a medicine and as I said this one is an important pollinator plant and because so many people are becoming more interested in her and which I'm really grateful we can stop putting poison on her we can start to eat her I allow her to grow in my garden not my garden the garden I caretake so that um, I can access her I've been adding the leaf in my salads. I can make teas. This is gonna support my kidneys. It has potassium, high in potassium. The flower can be made into wines, put into honey, made into mead. We can uh, batter the flower up to fry. Can be added into pancake mixes. Has a beautiful vitamin D. And uh, those stalks that you're seeing, the stems of the flower, those are fairly bitter. More I eat the bitters. Um, oh, you made a jelly. Beautiful, Leanne. That's, that's wonderful. The more I actually eat bitters, the more I realize that um, my body craves them. They're not as bitter as they were when I first started. And what I'm doing with these stems is I've been chopping them up and frying them with butter and garlic and adding them to my eggs so scrambling my eggs unbelievably delicious and if any of you know uh, Sharon Kellis with um, Earth Gleaners I noticed on her Instagram today that she took these stems and she wove a small little basket with with the dandelion stem so now we can find something else that we can actually do the root goes down into the soil about a meter so it's pulling a lot of minerals like calcium iron beta carotenes that converts into vitamin a and also inulin which helps to stabilize our blood sugars and i don't know if you can kind of see right at the back of the picture there on the on the left hand side you can see the flower head is closed and it's got a little white tip that's full of seeds. So the flowers always close in the rain or when the sun goes down. And then at some point it will stay closed and the, the flower petals will turn into the seeds. So I have started collecting those seeds in, in that stage when they're closed because they're easier to transport and I've been stuffing some jars and bags with them so that I can share outward. And um, yes, when when's the best time to eat the, the leaves and the flowers? Right now, Allie. Uh, you know, the smaller the leaf, oh, that's the first time you've ever heard of someone eating the stem. Well, I'll tell you, it was, um, you know, some of the participants that have come on my walks that have said, well, in Italy, we eat the stem. And I thought, okay, I'm going to try it. And it's unbelievably delicious. I will let you know that it, that it does have a latex. So you need to be mindful if you have allergies to latex. Um, so Oregon grape is better. Um, okay, sorry, two, two um, chats came at the same time. Uh, the Oregon grape berry is sour you would probably get a bitter from the leaf but that leaf would be harder to actually add into a salad unless it was uh, really young and soft and tender because they get kind of they're kind of stiff they're quite thick this leaf is much easier to chew on the dandelion here so right now you can be harvesting your leaf right now you can be harvesting the flower and i do leave the flower i don't harvest the flower until it's in great abundance and there are other flowers so that i'm not interrupting the flow of the nectar for um, our pollinators because so many 
um, people are now more interested in the dandelion. That's why I'm really highly recommending gather the seeds and, and really let her come into your garden and, sh and share those seeds outwards. So my friends, I feel like it might be close to time. Am I, am I right? You are amazing. 716. Okay. That's perfect. Um, I just want to clarify a question by Jeremy who asked what organ does bitter things help? And what organ oh. is that kidney? It's the gallbladder. The gallbladder. So bitter, yep. Bitter um, stimulates the gallbladder, and then that gets the bile into the stomach to help break down fats. Because we've got to we've got to recognize that it's really important that we're eating lots of fats to um, break down. Uh, oh, to feed the brain. There we go. To actually feed the brain. Perfect. Right. We don't. You know. We don't want Alzheimer's. Right. We want to make sure that we're eating through the seasons, not eating too much carbohydrates. Uh, you know, there's some uh, research that's saying too much carbohydrates is actually affecting the brain. It's not glucose that feeds the brain, it's fats that feed the brain. So if we're eating those fats, then we better have that bitter in there to make sure that we're accessing them. So beautiful. Well, I hope that was helpful, my friends. I hope that gave you some good ideas thinking about your gardens. And um, as um, mentioned earlier, I think, did you want to put a post up or a website who they would contact if they want to order plants, where they're going to find some plants there, Charlotte? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I can actually do that right now. So I have a few links for you guys. Um, the first one will be where you can order your plants, your native plants from the Wild Bird Trust who co-hosted this event. The second is a sign-up sheet if you're interested on more events like this with the Wilderness Committee. And the third is the Facebook event to the bigger webinar series. We have one more series coming up. Um, Lori, this was amazing. <laughs> Seriously, I've been to many, many plant talks and this was incredible. I learned things about some of the native plants I have here in my garden that I had no idea. So thank you so much. And I'm sure a lot of other people feel the same way. That was incredible. Um, before we sign off, um, I just want to open the floor to Leanne. Uh, did you want to jump on or Maddie to, to say a few words on behalf of Wild Bird Trust? Can I, I can unmute you, Leanne. Hey. Hello. Hey. Hey. Hey, hi. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Thanks, Lori. You're welcome. Yeah, wonderful. And wonderful images and so lovingly shared. So um lots to go from and we're so blessed here with the plentiful plants and all the pollinators um and thanks charlotte again for initiating this series uh reaching out to maddie who's our amazing volunteer at the coast salish plant nursery at maplewood flats um and helping to organize the online ordering um i popped the um uh, the link uh a few uh comments ago to be able to order any plants that you want. Um, we do have an online ordering system so you would email once you kind of see our inventory and figure out what you'd like to get that we still have available um, then Maddie or, or another volunteer Jillian would respond and say yes and set up an invoice and you pay and then you would come on site carefully between one and two on Saturdays when we have the pickup arranged um kind of like the curbside thing going on so um yeah and um i can vouch for everyone who, who lives in an apartment that uh, you can grow native plants on your apartment there are tons of ways um and i've had i live on the fifth floor and i've had bumble bumblebees and birds come up so it can happen <laughs> there we go maddie's dilemma yeah, yeah, Maddie had, had noted that um, we do offer deliveries for those who aren't able to um, to get to us. We can get to you. Perfect. Well, um, 
I think, is that good, Leanne? Did you want to? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then just about the next talk, do you want to? Yeah, so the next talk we have coming up is more focused on native pollinators. We're having Martina and Marika from the Native Bee Society of BC come and explain the ecology, the inner world of bees. It's so complex, it's so incredible, and I'm really looking forward to it. It's happening a week from now at 6.30, so on a Wednesday, uh, for World Bee Day. And yeah, we wanna highlight um, the fight of the native pollinators that we have uh, here. So yeah, that's um, that would be our last event of the series. And I hope you all, if you're interested, will show up. Lori, thank you so much. This was incredible. Um, yeah, I've, I've recorded the video so that people will be able to uh, watch if they weren't able to make it uh, today. So with that, I think we'll sign off. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna I'm going off onto another Zoom thing here for 7:30. So perfect wow. time. again, thank you so much to the Wilderness Wild Wilderness Committee and also to Maplewood Flats and to Birds Unlimited. Was it Birds Unlimited? Was that who it was? No. Wild Bird Trust. Wild yeah, Bird Trust. We are there. we are Wild Bird Trust at Maplewood Flats. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. beautiful, awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to come over and meet you all. Okay. Yeah, and I just put a, a link to the next um, webinar that you can find on Wilderness Committee Beautiful. Uh, website as well. Amazing. Okay. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.